I'll start with the introductions. Um, so we have Dr. Carlos Detour Jr. Um, he graduated from Oswego High School and attended Loyola College where he earned his bachelor's degree graduating cum laude. He had obtained his medical degree from the American University of the Caribbean School of Medicine and completed his family medicine residency at St. Joe's Hospital in Syracuse. Um, Dr. Detour is the medical director for the Wound Care Center. He also works as a hospital hospitalist at Oswego Hospital, and he has a private practice. So he's a very busy man. Um, we also have here tonight Chris Strumfler. She's the nurse practitioner at the Wound Care Center. Um, her history, she recently provided 20 years of care at St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, and she moved to Oswego five years ago and worked in the PACU and endoscopy at Oswego Health. She recently um, obtained her master's in nursing education and nurse practitioner degree from Keuka College and also serves in the U.S. Navy Reserves for the last 18 years. Um, so Chris has been with the Wound Care Center for a year now and has done a great job, if I can say that. Um, and then third on our panel, we have Sue Calloway, who's an RN. She's a diabetes educator for Oswego Health, and she provides individual and group classes on diabetes management. Um, you'll find in front of you different resources for some of those programs that I've talked about. Um, if after the presentation you have any questions, feel free to either call Sue's number on the brochures or the Wound Care Center number, and we'd be happy to help you out. So we're going to get this evening started with Dr. Detour. I'll just make sure that I don't trip. Don't get a wound. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so generally, uh, I want to just kind of briefly introduce diabetes, some, and then we'll kind of get into kind of what Sue does, and then Chris does in the wound care and kind of specifics. But so pretty much diabetes. What are we talking about? You see it on TV all the time. Affects about 425 million people um, worldwide. Um, you know, uh, it's pretty much uh, characterized by. Um, high sugar, um, not able to process sugar, or you're having an impairment of getting the sugar into your muscles. So leading to high sugar in the blood, okay? Um, and then, you know, this picture, a lot more detail than kind of what you guys need to know, but pretty much basically you eat in this, you eat food going through the stomach, stomach processes, you know, the food that you eat, sugar gets released in the blood, and we have a couple ways of getting the sugar out of the blood and into where we need it. Uh, the pancreas secretes some insulin, that's a natural thing that we have that our body produces to lower the sugar by getting it back into different tissue, okay? Um, a lot of things that we kind of see in the treatment, which we'll get into, kind of helps alleviate um, where we can get that blood sugar lower, okay? Uh, how do you know if we have it? So a big thing that we see kind of in the office, Doc, I'm drinking a lot, I'm really thirsty, I'm peeing a lot, sometimes I get blurry vision. You know, all these things are signs of kind of high sugar. Um, so generally, you know, these are kind of the symptoms that you might experience if you're starting to go down that road of diabetes, okay? And more or less, we're speaking about diabetes too. Um, diabetes type one, we see more in kids, and I can talk to these guys later. <laughs> about that, but uh, really we're just targeting diabetes too. Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about here. Uh, so based on the ADA, American Diabetes Association, four ways to really diagnose it. Uh, first and foremost, the A1C, three kind of, uh, uh, three symbol kind of abbreviation that everyone kind of who has diabetes should pay attention to and should remember. Okay, hemoglobin A1C. So that's just a measure kind of, of long term what your sugars would look like over a, 
I don't know, like a, a long-term period, okay? So greater than 6.5 at any point, you're probably going down that road of diabetes, okay? Uh, another test that we might do, an eight-hour fasting sugar. So if that's over 126, again, all indicators that that's probably something that we should start looking out for. Um, we do an oral glucose tolerance test. So we're gonna give you like 75 grams of a sugar drink. And in two hours, some way, somehow, like we were talking about in the slide before, your body should start processing that sugar to where it should be less than 200. And in a two hour span, if it's not, again, we're gonna go start moving on to different things, okay? <clears throat> I don't really use this last one, this fourth one, symptoms with a random glucose. I think more or less in the general kind of practitioner world, everyone's getting an A1C or a fasting sugar, okay? Okay, so we know you got it now, you're feeling it. What are we gonna do to help you, right? Um, Sue's gonna talk a little bit more about these things uh, in specifics, but really, before we start you on medication, we're gonna try some diet modification, okay? Uh, we're gonna get you to exercise and eventually, hopefully, get you to lose some weight, okay? All that probably helping to bring down the sugar because the diet, I mean, first and foremost, what you're putting into your body is kind of what your body is, right? So who grabbed the cookie? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. Right, so if you're a diabetic, we're gonna say, you know, you, maybe you should back off on the sugars, right? Because you've already got high sugar, why put more sugar in the place where there is high sugar, right? Um, exercise, again, one of the ways that we limit the sugar in our blood is our tissue is actually using sugar, right? So getting to be um, active and increasing your metabolism will drive the sugar from your blood into your tissues where it's actually utilized and not just hanging out in your blood, okay? And then weight reduction, again. We're trying to increase your metabolism. We're trying to get you to lose weight because in our own process and kind of specifics, the liver produces some sort of um, glucose when in times that we need it. And if you're carrying a lot more body weight, then you're producing a lot more glucose, which is something that we don't want. And especially when we're breaking down uh, fat with that too. Again, it's, um, we're just really concerned about getting you active, getting you to lose weight, so we can kind of make sure that your sugars are under control. Okay, so again, we've tried that. We maybe gave you three months, maybe six months, you know, depending on how well you're doing, how well it's working, how well it's not working, and then we're gonna move on to medication. So um, I just highlight this briefly, kind of the different examples of the medication you might be on. Um, I think a lot of people have probably heard of metformin, something that we kind of first start patients on. Biggest thing is really a lot of people end up getting a lot of GI distress. What does that mean? Kind of uh, a lot of nausea, maybe a lot of kind of um, activity, meaning a little bit more bowel movements. So something to watch out for, but it's a good drug because not only does it kind of help limit the sugar, but it also kind of helps with weight loss, okay? A couple of these medications have kind of fallen out of favor because of weight gain, okay? And some of them are weight neutral. The newer medications, which are really expensive that you see on TV, not really expensive, but to the point where um, some insurances just still don't cover it yet. So you've heard of Victoza and Saxenda. Okay, an injection that really is promoting weight loss and one of the really good medications that we're using now in the office setting to get people to lose weight. And once they're stable on this dose, um, you, we've seen about 10 to 15 pounds in a couple patients that I've seen personally in the office, okay? And as we lose weight, again, sugar comes under control and maybe eventually you're not even on the medication anymore, okay? Um, so 
I don't really want to go into too many specifics because um, I don't. I mean, that could be like a three-day pharmacological lecture. But one thing that I do want to highlight: Hey, doc. I know we got the sugar, but I'm never going to go to needles. I don't ever want to give myself injections. And I think that came from back in the day when we saw that the typical picture of injections was a needle that was maybe three inches. And I just put this on here now because these are our modern day needles, okay? Literally, it is this little tiny metal piece. It's no longer that picture with the syringe and the orange top and the metal that's sticking out four inches. Really simple. We kind of, they've kind of moved on to these, alt, they call them ultra fine needles. So we kind of dial the dose in over here at the end. Um, you know what the dose is. It's loaded already as soon as you twist the cap and all you have to do is plunge it into the skin in a fatty place and automatically the dose is inserted. So there's no more drawing one needle from one vial, switching another needle and injecting yourself. So that's the only reason why I bring that up because I think a lot of people get this um, reservation of getting to insulin because of these injections, but when really it's, it's changed totally and drastically, okay? Um, again, this is from one of the databases, one of the scholarly articles of kind of how we go through different medications and what the medication regimen would be like if you saw someone, if you saw your PCP. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because each provider has their own kind of way of going from one medication to the next, to the next, to the next, or you know, going into insulin right away. And I think that's better conversation between you and your doc, because it's all individualized, okay? Um, so we talked about how do we know we have it? How do we treat it? So now we gotta look out uh, for kind of complications in the end. So what happens if you know, it just goes out of control, right? We can't control it. Maybe we're not exercising so much. Maybe the medications aren't working so much. So diabetes can kind of be broken down into two big kind of uh, delineations in terms of complications. So macrovascular, that just means your big, your big arteries, your big veins, okay, and micro. That's the little ones, okay? The little ones being in your eye, which causes eye problems, which is why you always see an eye doctor once a year when you have diabetes in your kidneys. So why we always get blood tests and why we always look for kind of your renal function as you go through diabetes, because again, microvascular being in the kidneys and then neuropathy. So your nerves, and another reason why you guys always see a podiatrist when you have diabetes to check that you don't have any foot wounds or ulcers because you can't feel them when you step on a nail or you stub your toe and you've got a chronic wound. So Chris will talk a little bit more about these complications. One thing that I did want to highlight is with these macrovascular um, breakdown of diabetes, big, big push on the cardiologist's end to control diabetes. They call it um, strict glycemic control because what they found now in studies more recently is that diabetes is almost the same thing as a coronary artery disease equivalent. So really, really big risk factor for a heart, for heart attack going forward. That's why we want to get your sugar under control. That's why all these medications are on TV. That's why we're putting on the lecture today. It's really important for us to kind of make sure that this is in people's heads and we're aware of it, both on the patient end and the provider end. Okay, so I think next is Sue. She's gonna kind of talk about what she does and then we'll get over to Chris and kind of talk about the wound care, okay?
All right. Hi. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, so I'm just going to cover a little bit about diabetes, how it's affecting our community, what we're seeing, and what I do to help, you know, help everybody manage this disease. Um, the facts. So as Dr. Detour said, it's a huge concern. 30.3 million children and adults in the United States are living with diabetes. There's another 84 million Americans who have pre-diabetes, diagnosed or undiagnosed. Um, and that means 1.7 million Americans are diagnosed with diabetes every year. That's one every 19 seconds. It's a huge factor and it's a huge financial factor as well. So these statistics are from 2012, and that's the most recent statistics that are available at this time. But $245 billion is the total economic burden that we're looking at with diagnosed diabetes and hospitalization. Um, that means one in every five of our health care dollars is spent on diabetes. Um, if our trends continue the way that we are looking at them now, we're looking at possibly seeing one in every three Americans having diabetes by the year 2050. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that's a concern. And what we're looking at in Oswego County in particular is our diabetes rate is 9.9%. Our state average if you count New York City is 9%, if you count, if you take New York City out of it is 8.5%. So we're quite a bit above the state average. This average for the United States in general is 9%. So we are above that as well. We have a high rate of diabetes in this county. Um, what is diabetes? So Dr. Detour talked about that. Uh, this is just my little breakdown. Type 1, it's about 4 to 6% of people with diabetes. It's an autoimmune condition, essentially, unless you've had your pancreas removed. It's usually an autoimmune um, disease, which means that, you know what, your cells attack the cells in your pancreas that make insulin, and you're not making insulin anymore. You need insulin to survive. But what we're talking about today and what we're concerned about these trends rising is the type 2 diabetes. Do we know what causes it? We don't know what causes type 2 diabetes. We wish we did. <laughs> the problem is it, we do know a lot of risk factors and we'll go over those in a minute. Um, diabetes is a combination of things. So it means that you're resistant to insulin. Your insulin isn't working very well. You're very resistant to it. And it also means that we're not making as much insulin as we used to. So those beta cells in your pancreas that make insulin aren't able to put out unlimited amounts of insulin anymore. Um, and this can be treated many ways. Sometimes we can treat that with diet and exercise and that's all we need. Sometimes we need to add the oral medications. Sometimes we need to add those injectables or the insulin. Diabetes does tend to be a progressive disease. So sometimes even though you're doing what you should be doing, a few years down the line, it's changed and we have to continue to monitor that and see our doctors and have those you know, exams done and those testings done so that we can make sure that we're on top of this. The risk factors. So like I said, we still don't know what causes type 2 diabetes. We do know what the risk factors are. Family history. Family history is huge. You know, unfortunately, there's nothing you can do about that part. Uh, being overweight. So like Dr. Detour was referring to earlier, being overweight automatically makes us a little more resistant to this insulin. It makes it not work very well. And that liver is putting out extra sugar that you don't need. A sedentary lifestyle, so that goes back to the exercise portion of it. We need to be moving around, we need to be active, we need to keep busy. Stress, uh, both emotional and physical stress can raise blood sugars as well. Sometimes we have, you know, we can help to control that, sometimes we don't have a lot of control over that part of it. Aging, unfortunately, it seems like everything. You get a little bit older, your chances of different disease processes increase. Injury to the pancreas. You know, obviously if that portion of the pancreas gets injured in any way, that can affect how much insulin you're able to produce. And our ethnicity. Some of the ethnic uh, backgrounds have a higher rate of diabetes 
than, than others. So that's another concern. The complications, as Dr. Detour reviewed, you know, we're very concerned about your eye health. We're very concerned about your kidneys. It's still the leading cause of kidney failure in this country. Um, heart disease is huge. You know, it, diabetes contributes to both st uh, strokes and heart attacks. Neuropathy, 60% of non-traumatic lower limb amputations are a result of neuropathy and diabetes. Um, decreased ability to fight infection, so that's another major factor at the wound center. We've got some neuropathy, our circulation is not working the way that it should, and we can't fight infection the way that everyone else can if we can't control those blood sugars. So controlling those blood sugars is very important in helping to heal those infections. And then sexual dysfunction can be another complication of diabetes. We know it's a serious lifelong condition. Diabetes cannot be cured at this point. It can be treated. We can keep it controlled, but we cannot cure it. So what we end up talking about, of course, is self-care. Because 95 to 99% of your diabetes management ends up being in your lap. You're the one who has to decide what, what they take when their food's laid out in front of you, right? When the holidays come. And you're the one who has to make those decisions. You're the one who has to make the decisions about whether I lay on the couch tonight and watch a marathon of some show or I get up and get some exercise. You're the one who has to decide whether they test their blood sugar and those kinds of things. So that's what I usually am talking about. Um, diabetes education. As Olivia said earlier, I often see people one-on-one -on -one in my office, or we have some group classes available. We do some, a couple support groups every month, and we have some classes that are open to the public, um, you know, free and open to the public that the hospital has been supporting for several years now on diabetes self-management and healthy living classes. And we also offer the National Diabetes Prevention Program. So if you are somebody who has prediabetes or has risk factors, for prediabetes, that's a class that we offer. It's a year-long class um, that offers all kinds of tips in preventing or at least delaying the onset of type 2 diabetes. We talk about meal planning. We talk about exercise. We talk about blood sugar testing. We talk about your medications. We talk about stress management. So with meal planning, we learn how different foods affect your blood sugar. You know, what affects your blood sugar? What doesn't affect my blood sugar? It's as important to know what doesn't raise my blood sugar as it is to know what does raise my blood sugar. We learn to count carbohydrates. We talk about carbohydrates. These are the things that raise my blood sugar. It's not that I can't have them, but I need to be careful how many I have at one time. My pancreas can't keep up, can't make unlimited amounts of insulin, so I need to be careful with that. We do that by label reading. We do that by measuring. We do that a lot with the apps on our phones these days. We can go out to dinner and find out very quickly how many carbs are in that entree we just ordered. Um, we talk about portion size, and they gave you little portion cups tonight. So we talk about portion size. We talk about the timings of the meals and the snacks if it's related to your medications or related to your exercise. Um, we learn how to cope with your favorite foods. You know, if you're that person who can't have a half gallon of ice cream in the freezer because you eat the whole thing, then we got to say, hey, it's probably not the best idea to have it in the house. You know, if you're somebody who can deal with having a little scoop once in a while, then okay. You know, we talk about those things. Holiday dinners, it's a huge one, right? Right now, we just talked about this at support group as well. What are some of the ideas to, ho you know, to cope with the holiday dinners and the foods and all the snacks and everything that are going to show up in your office and at home and everybody's being nice and they're bringing all these home-baked goods. Um, the food police, that gets a little frustrating too if somebody's following you around 24 hours a day telling you what you can eat and what you can't eat. And they may not even have the correct information sometimes. So we do talk about that. I always encourage people, if there are other people who want to come, when we have an educational session, you bring them. I've had as many as 11 people. We've crammed them into the room. You know, it is as important for your spouse, your children, your, you know, grandmothers, anybody who wants to participate, to participate in this so they know exactly what you're doing, what you're dealing with. Exercise. Got to move around. You know, those muscle cells are using that sugar for fuel. So the more we use that muscle, 
the better our blood sugar is going to be. So the benefits of exercise, um, how to deal with the blood sugar fluctuations. Sometimes we have to do medication adjustments. Sometimes we have to talk about the proper timing of exercise. Um, and then we have to talk about physical limitations. Not everybody can do what the ADA is asking. The American Diabetes Association is asking for 30 minutes of moderate activity five times a week. Or break it down, you know, it doesn't matter how we break it down. But for some people, just walking from here to the bathroom is a struggle. They have other health issues as well. So we have to talk about if you physically can't walk across the room, well, hey, maybe you can sit there when you're watching TV with a soup can and do a few curls with that, you know? It doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be a lot of activity, but can we at least increase it a little bit from where you were? <clears throat> Blood sugar testing. Nothing is more frustrating to people than to test their blood sugar and have done exactly the same thing today that I did yesterday and get a different number. Or to get this high number or this low number, it doesn't make sense. So we talk about how, we talk about why, we talk about where, we talk about when, um, we talk about what's normal. And we'll talk about, you know, uh, I will specifically talk to people about testing before a meal and after a meal because I want you to see how did that meal affect your blood sugar. You know, just testing every morning doesn't always tell you what's going on all day. So we give you some parameters, suggest some testing so that you're getting something out of it. So you're understanding where you are and, and you know, what, is that good, is that bad? How did this food go? Oops, I can't eat that anymore. That didn't work out so well. Or this was much better than I thought it was going to be. Um, interpreting the results and sometimes adjusting those meals or exercise based on those results. Medications. Um, again, the how, what, where, why. You need to understand what your medication does. Some of them, I've had people come to the office, they've had diabetes for 20 years. They've been taking the same pill every night before they go to bed, and it's meant to be taken before a meal because it helps your body make more insulin while you eat. And just moving the timing of that pill can make a huge difference in those blood sugar numbers. And you get your prescription, it just says take once a day. It might even say take with food, but you know what, I take all my other medications at night. But if you actually understand this is what this particular medication does and this is why you need to do it then, it makes sense to you, you're probably more likely to do that. What to expect from the medications, what to watch for, what's good, what's bad. Um, and this is probably the biggest one, assistance with financial expenditures. So I spend a fair amount of time, unfortunately insurance companies are, you know, difficult for everybody. <laughs> um, they tell you which medication you can order for patients, they tell you what you can take, what you can't take. And so very often people will leave the hospital, they will get to the pharmacy, they go to get their prescription and it's $375. They don't have $375. And we were hesitant a lot of times to call our doctor and say, I can't afford $375. We don't want to tell people that maybe. Or we just think that's, that's what it is. There's no options. And they're very often our options. You know, we may be able to just change the brand name. It's the same medication, but a different brand. And your pharmacy is going to cover that. So never be afraid to pick up the phone and say, you know, either call your insurance company first. This is what they ordered. What, could, what would you cover at a better rate? Or to give me a call or to give your doctor's office a call. Because very often we can fix that problem. We can find something that is affordable for you. Or if you say, you know what, I just can't afford this class of drugs, maybe we have to work at finding a different combination that does work for you. A lot of the drug companies have financial aid. A lot of the drug companies have little coupons or, you know, sometimes the doctor's offices get samples. So that is, I think, I, think, I believe 60%, if that was the figure that I read in one of the surveys, 60% of the people who are non-compliant with their medications, it is simply because they cannot afford them. Um, stress management. So we need to sometimes identify are there stressors? What are the stressors? 
um, it does affect blood sugar. We, so we discussed that. How does that affect the blood sugar? You know, what is it, what is it we can do with that? Are there ways of coping with that? Um, are there ways that we can eliminate those stressors? We could talk about that. If there can't, what are the other things we can do? Sometimes it's a meditative thing. Sometimes it's a counselor. Some, so there's a lot of options available that we can talk about as well. I think that's all I have on this. So I guess we'll save the questions till the end, unless anybody has anything pressing right now. And I'll pass it over to Chris. Thank you for coming. Wounds. Wounds are gross. <laughs> okay? We don't want them. I never knew I'd be treating wounds and love my career. Someone's got to do it. <laughs> but they're gross. But the best part is, it's rewarding. We can fix them. Okay? So we have a great team at Legal Health. We're an outpatient clinic, and you have myself, Dr. Dave Tor. Um, we're up to what, five nurses now, and we have Katie, who's with us today, who runs our hyperbaric chamber. So we have a great team. No one wants to go to a wound clinic, but we try to make it, I've renamed it as the wound care family. Because when you come there, we treat you like you, we're all family. We laugh, we cry, we have fun. Diabetic ulcers are a big part of my day. The biggest thing is, let's prevent them. Let's do foot checks. We should be checking our feet every day. We ordered some mirrors. We were hoping that we could pass out and have everybody take home because a lot of people have trouble seeing the bottom of their feet. So, we'll have them probably tomorrow. <laughs> so stop by the clinic and we'll give you one. <laughs> I use my cell phone. <laughs> there, yep. He uses his cell phone. But it's very important. It's A lot of people can't sit the bottom of the feet, can't reach their feet. But you can get any size mirror and put your foot over it with a light. And that. You also want to make sure you check in between your toes. And if we get ointments or creams, try to keep it out from in between the toes because that will increase moisture and cause breakdown and you cannot feel it because of your neuropathy. So it's very important to keep some of those areas more dry than others, okay? So when you come to me, how am I different than your primary care, your urgent care? Well, we're the wound clinic. Wounds are gross, but we love them. I have cupboards and closets of different dressings for every different wound. Primary care, the urgent care, the ER, you get gauze and ointment usually, okay? A dressing that might work for me might not work for you. A dressing that works for you for two weeks might not work for third week. If a wound or an ulcer is wet, draining a lot, we wanna make it more dry. We wanna pull out some of that moisture. However, if it's too dry, we wanna add moisture. So that old myth of I'll take the dressing off and leave it open to air at night, uh-uh. Not true. So we have all different lo we have different levels of your ulcers. Some can be really deep, so we want to heal them from the bottom up. If you let them heal from the top and you have that big hole underneath, it's not healed. You'll be back. There's different ways to heal them. If you have a diabetic ulcer on the foot, a lot of times we get them in the plantar region, which is the main ball of your foot. If you get them there, we look, the number golden one rule is to offload with a total contact cast. And what that does is that puts pressure, takes pressure off every time you're stepping because you're kind of walking evenly. Not everybody can get a cast because you have some other problems. You might be more of a fall or with the cast than without the cast. Might create more wounds though. We don't want that. 
Also, we debride, which means we take an instrument usually. In wound care, we like beefy, meaty tissue. We want hamburger meat. We want cells to grow on that hamburger meat, okay? We want to get rid of the slough, which I call yuck, because cells want the hamburger meat. If there's slough or yuck, bile, bird, and MMPs are some medical terms, we want to get that off. And just by scraping, you can't always see it, but we want to stimulate that tissue so it can accept new cells to grow in. We want flat, sandy beaches around those ulcers so those cells can come into the nice, beefy tissue. If we have cliffs or scabs or calluses around the ulcer, it's eating all the good cells to get in to go in on the wound bed. So when you come to me, we try to do it weekly at first. Sometimes we can go down to every two weeks. It depends on how much callus you grow or how much bur uh, bile burden or slough or yuck you get on top of that. We kind of scrape around the edges to get that stuff off. Okay, just to give you an idea how we're different. Um, in dressings, we order supplies through durable medical equipment to come to your house. Sometimes we have to get home care. Sometimes you have to come to the wound clinic to help you out with the dressing changes. So we also have hyperbaric therapy um, that is approved through most insurances for diabetic ulcers when you have osteomyelitis. Um, we've had a couple this year that we put in the chamber and have healed. Not only healed, probably saved them from amputation. So we are very proud of that. It does take a lot to get you in there paperwork-wise and visit-wise. We have to see you for at least a month. You have to go through several tests. You have to be on antibiotics. I have to prove to the insurance company that me doing the debridement and IV antibiotics, um, it's working, but with the hyperbaric therapy, it will work better. Now, what is hyperbaric, hyperbaric therapy? It's a chamber, clear glass. I'll show you a picture later on the slide where it's 100% oxygen. So when you go in there, our wounds and that beefy, meaty tissue like oxygen so that the new cells can be stimulated. So it helps that oxygen get from up here all the way down to the toes. Negative pressure wound therapy, that is when we take a sponge on some wounds and we put them in the wound bed to um, suction continuously to keep stimulating the wound bed plus pull out the drainage at the same time. There are big ones that you've seen on big wounds in the hospital with an eight pound canister, but we also have little ones that we can use on some wounds that can go on your lower limb and you just put it on your belt or your pocket, nobody even knows you have it. We do, I do a lot of compression wraps. Even though you might be a diabetic, you probably have some vascular problems. If we have a lot of edema or some vascular problems and you have swelling, which is edema in your legs, we want to control that swelling so that blood can get to the toes. So if we squeeze the leg, it will increase the blood flow and get to that beefy, meaty tissue and help the wound to heal. So sometimes we have to do a combination of things. And we also encourage probably sometimes to get compression Velcro wraps. You've heard of stockings. I'm not a stocking fan because they're hard to put on and take off, plus you can get wounds from putting them on sometimes because they have to be really tight. So it's a struggle, but I do like the Velcro wraps that you'll see around. And then I also do topical application of skin substitute, approved by most insurances for diabetic ulcers. And there's a whole bunch of different ones out there, but I fought with a lot of wounds for a period of time. Finally, I go to the insurance company and say, I need some help. Let's take some cellular substitution, put it on this wound and see what we can do. And sometimes after four, five, six applications, finally the wound starts closing and healing. Okay, so it's a combination of things. It depends on you and your body and how much you, another thing is offloading. Okay, so we gotta take it easy. Just because I put a cast on you doesn't mean you can go to Destiny and walk around the mall. Here's our hyperbaric chambers. We have two at Oswego Health, okay. And um, Katie is our hyper certified hyperbaric technician. And she is in the room with you. Our RNs also do it. A provider is always in house um, when we have somebody in the hyperbaric chamber. If anybody is ever interested in seeing these, just call the clinic and we'll give you a tour and we can show you how it works. 
And it's not just for diabetic ulcers. It does treat other things too. This is our nine essential steps of heologics on how we go about when there is an ulcer. This is, we do this automatically. So we're assessing for adequate tissue perfusion. Then we're saying, did I remove all the non-viable necrotic tissue? Any of that skin that doesn't need to be there, did we get it off so that that beefy meaty tissue can start to heal? Is there any signs of infection or inflammation? Do we need to handle that? Presence of edema, swelling is what edema means. <clears throat> Create conductive wound healing environment. Is the wound happy? Does it look happy? Optimize tissue growth. Offload or relieve pressure on wounds. We've already talked about that. Control pain. There's different things that we can do for pain especially with diabetics who have neuropathy, there are some medications out there that we can try that's different, okay? But you gotta make sure you bring your med list to your appointments because not all medicines can be mixed or they're the same, they might have the same kind of medicines in other medication. So that's what, how we go through our steps. So for 2018, as of um, October 31st, we had a 97% healing rate for 20-day average. Can I heal everybody in 20 days? Absolutely not. I'm pretty honest when I see you. I hope to heal most people in four to six weeks, but sometimes by how much you, we make a plan. It's not me telling you we do a plan of care among the people in the room because I can sit up here and tell you not to eat that cookie, but if you want to have a cookie, you know, every other day we have to work with you. And that's just saying that we work all together with the vascular surgeons, diabetic educators, lymphedema services, home health care. And that's all I have to say. Do you have anything else, Olivia? No? Does anybody have any questions you want to ask? Any? I have a question for Sue. Okay. So, because it was asked to me earlier, and I said, I don't know, we'll ask Sue. So if somebody wants to go out to a bar, and they don't want any beer, what is the best alcoholic beverage to have that might be okay for diabetes, or for the sugar? Usually, usually one alcoholic drink will not affect blood sugar. You will actually lower it a little bit, not saying. <laughs> <laughs> once we get past one or two, you're really getting into a danger zone. Because once we get past one or two, not only are some of the things that are in the alcohol eventually going to you know, catch up with us, but we're going to feel a little bit happier about grabbing those pretzels or having whatever it is. So. I, uh, yeah, I consider me, myself, a bigger beer drinker, and I'm on insulin, and some nights I can have four, five, six beers even, and I take my reading in the morning, it's not bad. Other days I take, I just have one or two, and it jumps the scale right off the handle, so I, it's got to be the combination of the carbohydrates and what I eat right. during the day, right? right. Exactly. So, yeah. so I've tried to <coughs> test it after I have a cookie or three, four cookies, wait two hours and test it. And then, then I <laughs> see that. And it shows you, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, that's how I usually know what, what, what to eat, what not to eat. But I'm not. Right. You know, I don't. The other thing that alcohol does, and like I said, we have to, when I'm talking to people, I'm not talking about a short term plan. Diabetes isn't cured, so this is forever. So we do have to learn to deal with, hey, it's my birthday, you know what? I'm having the birthday cake tonight, or I'm going out and I'm having a drink or two tonight. So that's okay. But if we drink alcohol too much, it's empty calories. That adds more to the weight issue, and then we have to talk about that as well. So it's, you know, is it reasonable to have a drink or two? Absolutely. But is it something that we want to necessarily make a habit of? No, it's generally a drink or two now and then, not a drink or two every night. Not a drink or two every night, right. 
it just generally leads to some of the other habits as well. So, and the weight gain. You know, it really does add to weight gain as well sometimes. I have lost weight. You know what I mean? I have lost like, you know, 15 pounds. Well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not easy. It's not easy. And you know, we look a lot of times at these numbers. Um, you know, they tell us what our BMI is and they, we know how much weight we're supposed to lose. And we look at this big number. It doesn't take a big number to lower your blood sugar numbers. You know, don't look at it. It gets so frustrating to say I have 60 pounds to lose. You eventually you just go forget that. A reduction of five to seven percent of your weight makes a huge difference in those numbers. It could bring them down 10 or 15 points. So, you know, be happy with what you did. Be proud of yourself for what you did. If you've lost two pounds or three pounds or four pounds, you can see a difference in those blood sugar numbers a lot of times. You know, take credit for what you did do. Yes? How does, um, like just regular fruit, like fructose, how does that differ from any other sugar and should they be careful if you know if you have diabetes how should you look at fruit because um, i know a lot of people look at fruit like oh yeah i can eat that you know so absolutely sometimes there is a little bit of a difference in how we look at you know health healthy doesn't always mean won't raise my blood sugar absolutely so we do have to look at fruit and we do have to say it's good for me it's healthy for me there's tons of vitamins and minerals and things in there but as a diabetic, I still have to be careful how much of this I'm eating. And to be aware of which fruits, you know, the berries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, very low in natural sugars as compared to some other fruits. So we can look at those individually. Usually when I am talking to somebody in my office, I'm going through, you know, walk me through a day, what time you're getting up in the morning, what are you having for breakfast, what are you having to drink with that? You know, so we're going through the foods that you like and how do we work that in? How do we deal with it? But fruit, yes, is a, is a consideration as well. Is there a better time of day to exercise? Like prior, I don't, I just switched it up because I had plateaued and I'm probably pre, I'm not a diabetic as of yet, but the trend is there, I have family history. Um, but we walk four miles a day and we used to walk like after work between, between them and dinner and now, um, I'm getting up at 4.30 and I'm hammering the treadmill for four miles and, you know, I had a great weight loss. And, but I don't know if there's a better time or a worse time or is there a benefit? Uh, I don't know what everybody else has to say. This is what I say, whenever you're willing to do it. Because, okay. <laughs> you know, everybody has it. My <laughs> husband is that morning person. He would get up at 3 o'clock in the morning if I would and exercise. And I'm like, oh, that is not happening. <laughs> I will be fine in the evening and he's sitting on the couch going forget that I'm done so whenever you're willing to I think sometimes when we hit that plateau with exercise though it's because your body got used to that we got to step it up you know we've got to step up that game is is we do we have to go up some hills do we have to walk a little faster do we have to vary that exercise a little bit I don't know if anybody else is I think that's a good point I think it's called exercise tolerance yeah so <clears throat> here it's all yours yeah <laughs> exercise tolerance so you know you could be doing the same thing for 20 years is it really doing you as good as it was the first two months probably not never fair. <laughs> Recent studies show, though, if you do it in the morning, you you're behave better throughout the day. Because you feel good. It's just like, my, for example, myself, if I have a bit sugar in the morning, yep. it, I eat not good the rest of the day. Right. Where if you're clean, healthy, you continue, you know. How about if you have it in the diabetic break through the whole family? Now, I'm, I'm one of 14 in my family, and everyone is, got a, is a diabetic. Is it just in your blood, and you, no matter if you do everything by the book, you still, you still become a diabetic? Because yeah. your history, family history is, and, and is there. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, certainly we couldn't say that every one of your siblings would get it. But the chances are, it's that risk factor, and it's a strong risk factor. And there's nothing, you know, like I said, there are things that you can do as far as controlling the weight and the exercise. 
And then there are things you have absolutely no control over, and that's your ethnic that's what I'm background, saying. that's you, your you family. You do everything by the book, and you still go for uh, A, see the test, and it's high. Right. I said, oh boy, what, what a, you know, I might as well drink eight beers a night then. <laughs> they ain't gonna make any difference. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, make it go higher. Make it go higher. Right? <laughs> I'll yeah. the chart. Nice try. Nice try. <laughs> Just because you're deve right, developing the diabetes isn't necessarily your choice, but controlling <laughs> it is your advantage. choice. <laughs> Correct. You can't blame it on my brother. If you don't control it, it will damage your organs. Yeah. Other organs. You'll have to come and see Chris. I, I'm, I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> Uh, I'm here tonight because my sister lives in California and she's a diabetic and uh, she's been here well for several years she's been having a lot of trouble with her neuropathy in her feet burning feet burning um, just going you know I guess I came here to see if there was anything I could take out of this that I could maybe pass on to her what is there anything that, you know, at this point, would you suggest that she could do or not do? She's on medication. Uh, she's in control of her diabetes, as far as I know, but this has happened to her. And she's even telling me now that even, she's looking to see even some redness up on her leg, which kind of scared me. I thought, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, she doesn't seem to, she does what the doctor says. She takes her medicine. She eats what she should. Uh, she isn't really uh, one to go beyond and go look for information for herself. Um, I mean, what the doctor says is okay. I'm doing it. But, you know, this is all happening. And I'm thinking, maybe there's something you could be doing that you're not doing uh, before you get into real trouble. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to kind of the patients that I've seen too in the in the office. Certain patients could have a really good A1C, 6.5, 6.8, yeah. to the point probably because once they got it, they were really good about it. But the time before they got it, they weren't really good about it, and they might have been having it for maybe 10, 12 years. So the damage has already been done. There's certain medications that we can kind of help with uh, for that neuropathic pain. Um, you know, a lot of people use gabapentin. There's drugs like Lyrica too. Well, she, she has, has spoken about gabapentin. Yeah. Yes, so apparently her doctor has given her that, I guess. But I think to Sue's point, what she said earlier too, is it's not a curable disease. No. It's a progressive disease that's lifelong, right? So what we try to do is just kind of maintain it um, so sometimes just the neuro neuropathic pain that these diabetics feel is just the way that it hit them kind of at, at an individual level. I don't know what you kind of see, Sue. I know she has a swimming pool. Yeah. And in the summer she goes out and puts her feet in the pool because she can't, it's so hot, she can't stand them. Yeah. Uh, she's been to different uh, doctors or done Somebody told her they x-rayed her feet or something and said her bones were too close and they were pinching on the nerves. I mean, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> that was. And sometimes too, there's it might be something other than diabetes, you know. So that's another thing. If she's so good about her regimen, uh, it might be something else that's causing the nerve pain, which might be. Um, just like you've mentioned, worthwhile seeing other physicians about. Well, she, okay, the other thing is that, that I don't know if it's connected, or it is in some ways, but could you speak about the dawn phenomenon? Because she tells me when she gets up in the morning, her sugar is high, but as soon as she eats, it comes down. But is that because that, that evening or that middle of the night or whatever what happens what what causes that it typically has a lot to do with that the body's response to you needing to wake up in the morning and get going so it provides your body's going to provide you with that fuel to get moving but when we have type 2 diabetes uh, the body gets a little confused you know, 
there, it's like, here, have more, have more sugar. You know, that liver is just pouring some extra sugar out. So that is a, a that's a an, um, legitimate term, it dawn is. phenomenon. It is. Something is happening between the time you went to bed and the time that you get up that you don't even know about. Mm -hmm. Right. It's typically, if, you took if, we, if they were to wear this continuous glucose sensor where it's getting a blood sugar every five minutes all night long, we'd see that okay. all, most of the night until around three, four o'clock in the morning, it's okay. And then it starts this gradual rise. So my, that's a hormone effect. Can I okay. piggyback on that? So if you have that dawn phenomenon, would it be better to hop on the treadmill as soon as you get up in the morning and burn that sugar? Or is it... Is, does that not have any impact? Is that not helpful? Oh. I'm just curious. I'm just curious, wondering if you have that excess sugar and if exercise is a way to get rid of it. It is. It is. It is. And I, but I always caution people. You know, if you say you go out to dinner tonight and you eat something that you know is going to make your blood sugar high, and you go home and you jump on the treadmill, don't stay there for two hours till you fall off and you think the blood sugar is going to be okay. You know, That's exercise has an effect for a time period, 24 hours or so. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that whole jumping on the treadmill and doing it till I get that blood sugar where I want it to be, often doesn't solve that problem because it may even trigger some response in your body that provides you with more fuel, you know what I mean? So you don't want to make yourself crazy saying, I got to exercise until this blood sugar comes down. But you do want to have exercise in your routine every day. And she's actually right. When you get up in the morning and then have a little breakfast or something, get that metabolism kind of switched over, working differently, you typically see a lower blood sugar. <laughs> um, as soon as I, when I eat, then it's within, it's right. I test and it's good. And it's a hormone response that's difficult to combat. You know, there are different medications. If, certainly if somebody's on insulin, certainly if they're on an insulin pump, we can negate that by giving them more insulin at that time. Right, right. But we can't always change that effect. For some people, a little snack okay. that combines a little carbohydrate and protein at bedtime will kind of negate that and prevent that from happening. For some people, it doesn't work at all. Right. So I, My husband he passed away, but he was a diabetic for 10 years. He never took any, he controlled it with diet and exercise all that time. But in the morning, he would have that real high, and he was a patient of a doctor at the Jocelyn Center in Syracuse, and uh, she, she told him to have a little snack at night, whether it's the cracker or a little piece of cheese, or maybe a little bit of milk or something. And when he did that, there was a difference in the morning readings when he got, now that worked for him, but um, you know, like you say, maybe not work for everybody. And, and that, so back to what we talked about earlier, if I'm gonna have you check your blood sugar levels, I want you to do it where it means something to you, you're getting something out of it. So in this case, I would say, let's do a snack, about 15 carbs, a little bit of protein at bedtime, for three days in a row, give me your morning blood sugars. And for three days in a row, don't have that. Right. And if there's no point in that, if it's not working, then there's no point in you having more food if you don't right. need it. Right. You know what I mean? So, yeah, we have to, it doesn't work for everybody. Right. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? The issues is beginning with diabetic neuropathy. Is there any advantage to stimulating the nerves in the feet? Does that do anything positive to alleviate that? I haven't heard much of that. Um, what I was taught and trained with was as you get, when you're initially diagnosed with diabetes, with the pain that you're having, as the diabetes gets under control, so does the neuropathy, to a point where you're not past that point of the damage. I'm not sure what you guys can do. I know there are different treatments available. Um, I, I think the idea of a lot of times of that stimulation is get the circulation, get the blood there. Right. Um, people ha are hesitant sometimes to walk or exercise or something because it does hurt. 
And we're not saying that we want you to be that uncomfortable, but if you can handle that little bit of exercise or in some way get that circulation improved to the feet, the hope is that the pain is not as severe. Would it, would it for people like that uh, with uh, neuropathy in their feet and because of the stats, of course, of the circulation, I suppose, what's, there isn't enough, would they benefit from anything like massage therapy? You know, uh, well, it, yeah, it's along the same theory. So if you can get a little blood circulation, so there, that's the goal, the blood circulation. Careful. Okay. You have to be careful of getting, your, yeah. Who you're seeing, you know, what kind of treatment you're having. We don't want to damage the feet in any way. When you have nerve damage, you do, whether it's pain or whether it's numbness, you don't sense things the same way everybody else no. does. So I may step on a tack and not know that right. for several weeks, right. or you know, I. So acupuncture wouldn't hospital. acupuncture wouldn't be a good thing for. No. No. <laughs> don't do that. No. Okay. I wouldn't encourage that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, it's it's. Circulation may help a little bit, but the nerve damage is usually permanent. Yeah. You know, sometimes early in diagnosis, um, just because blood sugars are really high when they first get diagnosed and they've noticed some pain and tingling in their feet, and if we get it early enough and get those blood sugars down, sometimes that does go away. But if people have had diabetes for a long time, they typically have at least some degree of nerve damage. Mm -hmm. And some of it eventually, you know, it's, it's pain control. Well, she tell, told me she went for her physical and she had, of course, they check for her sugar, you know, they do a blood test. I, she said, I didn't have to fast. I said, what do you mean? You didn't get a fasting test for your sugar? No, I just went to, it was part of my physical at the office, and so they just took my blood at the office. I didn't fast. I've never heard of that. Is that a true reading of Well, they what? may be doing a random blood sugar okay. just in the office, Is it? or they may be doing, some people have their own off, in-office A1C machines okay. so well maybe and that is not required as a fact right not right exactly right. yeah i know that okay. but some people will just do a random blood sugar because your blood sugar really shouldn't be over 200 no matter what mm -hmm. you had to eat or drink well, my husband was treated for cancer and uh, leukemia, actually, and uh, when they first, we were in Arizona, and we were at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and uh, the first treatment he had, he had in the hospital to see if he was going to handle it okay. After the, and after that, his sugar was 600, but because part of it was steroids in that, so... And they had said, it, it'll come down. This is the steroids. Don't worry about it. But it, it did. But, you know, that's what some of the things can, I mean, I was like, oh, God, 600. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, I think this has been very informative, and I want to thank our panel here, and I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. So thank you.